Chapter 73 Two Sundays every month, Quinta drove the Massa to church at the Waller Meeting House about five miles from the plantation. The fiddler had told him that not only the Wallers, but also several other important white families had built their own meeting houses around the county. Quinta had been surprised to discover that the services also were attended by some of the neighboring lesser white families and even some of the area's quote, Poe Crackers, whom the buggy had often passed as they came and went on foot, carrying their shoes by the strings over their shoulders. Neither the Massa nor any of the other, quote, quality folk, as Bell called them, ever stopped to offer, quote, Poe Crackers a ride, and Kunta was glad of it. There would always be a long, droning sermon between a lot of equally listless singing and praying, and when it was finally over, Everybody would come trailing outside one by one and shake hands with the preacher, and Kunta would notice with amusement how both the Poe Crackers and those of the masses class would smile and tip their hats at one another, acting as if their both being white made them both the same. But then when they would spread their picnic lunches under the trees, it was always with the two classes on opposite sides of the churchyard, as if they had just happened to sit apart. While he was waiting and watching the solemn rite with the other drivers one Sunday, Roosby said under his breath, just loud enough for the others to hear, seem like white folks don't enjoy they eatin' no more and they worshipin'. Conta thought to himself that in all the years he had known Belle, he had always managed to claim some urgent chore whenever the time came for one of her Jesus meetings in Slave Row. But all the way from the barn, he had heard enough of the black one's caterwauling and carrying on to convince him that one of the few things about the two bob that he found worthy of admiration was their preference for quieter worship. It was only a week or so later that Belle reminded Quinta about the big camp meeting she planned to go on in late July. It had been the blacks' big summer event every year since he'd come to the plantation. And since every previous year he had found an excuse not to go along, he was amazed that she would still have the nerve to ask him. He knew little about what went on at these huge gatherings, beyond that they had to do with Belle's heathen religion, and he wanted no part of it. But Belle once more insisted. I know as how bad you always wants to go, she said in her voice, heavy with sarcasm. Just thought I'd tell you far enough ahead so as you can work it into your plans. Quinta couldn't think of a smart answer, and he didn't want to start an argument anyway, so he just said, I think about it, though he had no intention of going. By the day before the meeting, when he pulled up at the big house front door after a trip to the county seat, the massa said, I won't be needing the buggy tomorrow, Toby, but I've given Belle and the other two women permission to go to that camp meeting tomorrow, and I said it would be all right for you to drive them over in the wagon. Turning with anger, positive that Bell had plotted this, Quinta tied up the horses behind the barn, and without taking the time to unhitch them, headed straight for the cabin. Bell took one look at him standing in the doorway and said, Couldn't think up no other way to get you there. When Kizzy get christened. Get what? Christened. That means she joined the church. What church? That old laud religion of yourn? Don't let's start that again. Ain't nothing to do with me. Missy Ann done asked her folks to take Kizzy to the meetin' house on Sundays and set in the back whilst they prays up front. But she can't go to no white folks' church lest she get christened. Then she ain't going no church. You still don't understand, does you, African? It a privilege to be axed to the church. You say no, the next thing you and me both out pickin' cotton. As they set out the next morning, Kunta sat rigidly, staring straight ahead from his high driver's seat, refusing to look back, even at his laughing, excited daughter as she sat on her mother's lap, between the other women in their picnic baskets. For a while, they simply chattered among themselves. Then they began singing, We a climb in Jacob's ladder, we a climb in Jacob's ladder, we a climb in Jacob's ladder, soldiers of the cross. Quinta was so disgusted that he began slapping the reins across the mule's rumps, making the buggy lurch forward and jostling his passengers. 
but he couldn't seem to do it hard enough or often enough to shut them up. He could even hear Kizzy's piping little voice among the others. The two Bob didn't need to steal his child, he thought bitterly, if his own wife was willing to give her away. Similarly crowded wagons were coming out of other plantations' side roads, and with every happy wave and greeting as they rode along, Quinta became more and more indignant. By the time they reached the campground, in a flowered rolling meadow, he had worked himself into such a state that he hardly noticed the dozen or more wagons that were already there, and the others that were arriving from all directions. As each wagon pulled to a halt, the occupants would pile noisily out, hooting and hallooing, soon joining Belle and the others who were kissing and hugging each other in the milling crowd. Slowly it dawned on Kunta that he had never seen so many black people together in one place in Tupab land, and he began to pay attention. While the women assembled their baskets of food in a grove of trees, the men began to drift toward a small knoll in the middle of a meadow. Quinta tethered the mules to a stake that he drove into the ground, and then sat down behind the wagon, but in such a way that he could see everything that went on. After a while, all of the men had taken seats close to one another on the ground near the top of the knoll, all excepting four, who appeared to be the oldest among them. They remained standing. And then, as if by some prearranged signal, the man who seemed to be the oldest of the four, he was very black and stooped and thin, with a white beard, suddenly reared back his head and shouted loudly toward where the women were. I say, chillins of Jesus! Unable to believe his eyes or ears, Kunta watched as the women swiftly turned and shouted as one, Yes, Lord! then came hurrying and jostling to sit behind the gathered men. Quinta was astonished at how much it reminded him of the way the people of Jafur sat at the Council of Elders' meetings once each moon. The old man shouted again, I say, is y'all chillins of Jesus? Yes, Lord. Now the three other old men stepped out in front of the oldest one, and one after another they cried out, Gone come a time we be just God's slaves. Yes, Lord, shouted all who sat on the ground. You make yourself ready. Jesus, stay ready. Yes, Lord. Know what the Holy Father said to me just now? He say, ain't nobody strangers. A massed shouting rose, all but drowning out what the oldest of the four had begun to say. In a strange way, even Quinta felt some of the excitement. Finally, the crowd quieted enough for him to hear what the greybeard was saying. Chillins, O oh God, day is a promise land. That's where everybody believe in him gon' go, and them that believe, that's where they gon' live for all eternity. Soon the old man was sweating profusely, his arms flailing in the air, his body quivering with the intensity of his sing-song exclamations, his voice rasping with emotion. It tell us in the Bible that the lamb and the lion go and lay down together. The old man threw his head backward, flinging his hands toward the sky. Ain't going to be no masses and slaves no more. Just going to be all God's chillins. Then suddenly, some woman leaped up and began shrieking, Oh Jesus, oh Jesus, oh Jesus, oh Jesus. It set off others around her and within minutes, two dozen or more women were screaming and jerking themselves about. It flashed into Kunta's mind how the fiddler had once told him that on some plantations where the masses forbade slaves to worship, they concealed a large iron pot in the woods nearby, where those who felt the spirit move them would stick their heads inside and shout, the pot muffling the noise sufficiently for it not to be heard by the massa or the overseer. It was in the middle of this thought that Kunta saw, with profound shock and embarrassment, that Belle was among the women who were staggering and screeching. Just then one of them shouted, Eyes God's child, toppled to the ground as if felled by a blow, and lay there quivering. Others joined her and began writhing and moaning on the grass. Another woman, who had been flinging herself violently about, now went as rigid as a post, screaming out, Oh, Lord, just you, Jesus. Quinta could tell that none of them had planned whatever they were doing. It was just happening as they felt it. 
the way his own people danced to the spirits back at home, acting out what they felt inside. As the shouting and the twitching began to subside, it occurred to Kunta that this was the way the dancings in Jafur had ended, seemingly in exhaustion. And he could see that in some way these people too seemed to be both spent and at peace with themselves. Then, one after another, they began to get up from the ground and shout out to the others. My back pained me so bad till I talked to my lord. He said to me, he say to me, you stand upright, and I ain't hurt since. Didn't meet my lord Jesus till he saved my soul, and now I puts my love for him up against anybody's. There were others. Then, finally, one of the old men led a prayer, and when it was over, everybody shouted, Amen and began to sing loudly and with tremendous spirit. I got shoes, you got shoes, all God's chillins got shoes. When I gets to heaven, gonna put on my shoes, gonna walk all over God's heaven. Heaven, everybody telling about heaven ain't going there. Heaven, heaven, I'm going to walk all over God's heaven. As they sang the song, they had gotten up from the ground, one by one, and began to walk very slowly following the gray-haired preacher, down from the knoll and across the meadow. By the time the song ended, they had reached the banks of a pond on the other side, where the preacher turned to face them, flanked by the other three elders, and held up his arms. And now, brothers and sisters, the time is come for your sinners, what ain't been cleansed to wash away your sins in the river Jordan. Oh, yea, shouted a woman on the bank, it's time to squench out the fires o' hell and the holy waters o' the promised land. Say it, came another shout. All those ready to dive down for the almighty soul and rise up again with the Lord. Remain standing. Wrestle you what done been baptized or ain't ready for Jesus yet. Sit down. As Kunta watched in astonishment, all but twelve or fifteen of them sat down, while the others lined up at the water's edge. The preacher and the strongest of the four elders marched right into the pond, stopping and turning when they were immersed up to their hips. Addressing himself to the teenage girl who was first in line, the preacher spoke. Is you ready, child? She nodded. Then come ahead. Grasping both of her arms, the two remaining elders led her into the pond, stumbling to meet the others in the middle placing his right hand on the girl's forehead, while the biggest elder grabbed her shoulders with both hands from behind and the other two men tightened their grip on her arms. The preacher said, O oh Lord, let this child be washed clean, and then he pushed her backward, while the man behind pulled her shoulders back down until she was completely underwater. As the bubbles rose to the surface and her limbs began to thrash the water, they turned their gaze heavenward and held on tight. Soon she started kicking wildly and heaving her body violently. It was all they could do to hold her under. Almost, the preacher shouted over the churning commotion beneath his arms. Now, they pulled her upward from the water, gasping for breath, spewing water, struggling frantically as they half carried her back to shore and into the arms of her waiting mother. Then they turned to the next in line. A boy in his early twenties who stood staring at them, too terrified to move. They practically had to drag him in. Kunta watched with his mouth open wider as each person, next a middle-aged man, then another young girl around twelve, then an elderly woman who could barely walk, were led one by one into the pond and subjected to the same incredible ordeal. Why did they do it? What sort of cruel god demanded such suffering for those who wished to believe in him? How could half-drowning someone wash away his evil? Kunta's mind teemed with questions, none of which he could answer, until finally the last one had been pulled, spluttering from the water. It must be over, he thought, but the preacher, wiping his face with his sopping sleeve, stood in the pond and spoke again. And now, is day any amongst y'all wishes to consecrate day chillins to Jesus this holy day? Four women stood up, the first of them bell, holding Kizzy by the hand. Quinta leaped up beside the wagon. Surely they wouldn't. But then he saw Belle leading the way to the bank of the pond and began to walk, slowly, uncertainly at first, then faster and faster, toward the crowd at the water's edge. When the preacher beckoned to Belle, 
She leaned down to pick up Kizzy in her arms and strode vigorously into the water. For the first time in 25 years, since the day his foot had been chopped, Quinta began to run. But when he reached the pond, his foot throbbing, Bell was standing in the middle at the preacher's side, gasping to catch his breath. Quinta opened his mouth to call out, just as the preacher began to speak. Dearly beloved, we's gathered here to welcome another lamb unto the fold. What the child's name, sister? Kizzy, reverend. Laud, he began placing his left hand under Kizzy's head and squeezing his eyes shut. No, nah, Kunta shouted hoarsely. Belle's head jerked around. Her eyes were burning into his. The preacher stood looking from him to her and back again. Kizzy began to whimper. Hush, child, Belle whispered. Quinta felt the hostile stares surrounding him. Everything hung poised. Bell broke the stillness. It's all right, Reverend. That's just my African husband. He don't understand. I explain to him later. You go ahead. Quinta, too stunned to speak, saw the preacher shrug, turned back to Kizzy, shut his eyes, and start again. Laud, with his holy water, blessed his child. What her name again, sister? Kizzy. Bless this child, Kizzy, and take her with you safe into that promised land. With that, the preacher dipped his right hand into the water, flicked a few drops into Kizzy's face, and shouted, Amen. Bell turned, carried Kizzy back to shore, trudged up out of the water, and stood dripping in front of Kunta. Feeling foolish and ashamed, he looked down at her muddy feet, then raised his eyes to meet hers, which were wet. With tears? She put Kizzy in his arms. It's all right. She just wet, he said, his rough hand caressing Kizzy's face. All that running. You must be hungry. I sure is. Let's go eat. I brung fried chicken and devil eggs and that sweet tater custard you can't never get enough of. Sound good, said Quinta. Belle took his arm and they walked slowly back across the meadow to where their picnic basket sat on the grass in the shade of a walnut tree. Chapter 74 Belle told Kizzy one night in the cabin, You's going on seven years old. Feel hand youngins be already out there working any day, like that Noah, so you's gonna start being some use to me in the big house. Knowing by now how her father felt about such things, Kizzy looked uncertainly at Kunta. You hear what yo mammy say, he said, without conviction. Bell already had discussed it with him, and he had to agree that it was prudent for Kizzy to start doing some work that was visible to Massa Waller, rather than continue solely as a playmate for Missy Ann. He privately further liked the idea of her making herself useful, since in Jafur at her age, mothers started teaching their daughters the skills that would later enable their fathers to demand a good bride price from a prospective husband. But he knew well Belle didn't expect his enthusiasm about anything to bring Kizzy even closer to the two-bob and make her even farther away from him and the sense of dignity and heritage he was still determined to instill in her. When Belle reported a few mornings later that Kizzy was already learning to polish silverware, scrub floors, wax woodwork, even to make up the masses' bed, Kunta found it difficult to share her pride in such accomplishments. But when he saw his daughter emptying, then washing the white enameled slop jar in which the masa relieved himself at night, Quinta recoiled in anger, convinced that his worst fears had been fulfilled. He bridled, too, at the counsel he would hear Belle giving Kizzy about how to be a personal maid. Now, you listen to me good, gal. It ain't every get chance to work for quality white folks like Massa. Right off. That put you above the rest of the youngins. Now, the big thing is to learn what Massa want without him never having to tell you. You gonna start getting up and out early with me. Way fo Massa do. That's how I gets a head start on him. Don't always believe in that. First thing, going to show you how to whoop the dust out in his coat and pants when you hangs him out to air on the clothesline. Just be sure you don't break or scratch none of the buttons, and so on, sometimes for hours at a time. 
Not a single evening passed, it seemed to Kunta, without more instructions, down to the most ridiculous detail. For black in his shoes, she told Kizzy one night, I shakes up in a jar lil sim and beer and lamp black with lil sweet oil and rock candy. Dat stand overnight, then shake it up good again. It make them black shoes of his and shine like glass. Before he could stand no more of it and retreated for relief to the fiddler's hut, Quinta acquired such invaluable household hints as, if you set a teaspoon of black pepper and brown sugar mashed to a paste with a little cow's cream and a saucer in a room, ain't no flies coming in there no how. And that soiled wallpaper was best cleaned by rubbing it with the crumbly insides of two-day-old biscuits. Kizzy seemed to be paying attention to her lessons, even if Quinta didn't, for Belle reported one day, weeks later, that the Massa had mentioned to her that he was pleased with the way the Andirons in the fireplace had been shining since Kizzy started polishing them. But whenever Missy Ann came over for a visit, of course, the Massa didn't have to say that Kizzy was excused from work for the duration of her stay. Then, as always, the two girls would go romping and skipping about, jumping rope, playing hide-and-seek, and a few games they invented. Playing <laughs> Bursting open a ripe watermelon and jamming their faces down into its crisp wetness one afternoon, they ruined the fronts of their dresses, prompting Belle to send Kizzy yelping with a backhand slap, and to snap even at Missy Ann. You knows you's raised better in dat. Ten years old, going to school, and fo you knows it, going to be a high-class missy. Though Kunta no longer bothered to complain about it, he remained the most difficult mate for Belle to deal with during Missy Ann's visits and for at least another day afterward. But whenever Kunta was told to drive Kizzy to Massa John's house, it was all he could do to keep from showing his eagerness to be alone again with his girl child in the buggy. By this time, Kizzy had come to understand that whatever was said during their buggy rides was a matter between the two of them, so he considered it safer now to teach her more about his homeland without fear that Belle would find them out. Rolling along the dusty Spotsylvania County roads, he would tell her the Mandinka names of things they passed along the road. Pointing at a tree, he'd say, Yiro. Then downward at the road, Silo. As they passed a grazing cow, he'd say, Nin Semuso, and went over a small bridge, Salo. Once, when they got caught in a sudden shower, Kunta shouted, Sanjio, waving out at the rain, and when the sun appeared, pointing at it, he said, Tilo. Kizzy would watch his mouth intently as he said each word, then imitate what she saw with her own lips, repeating it over and over until she got it right. Soon she began pointing to things herself and asking him for their Mandinka names. One day they were hardly beyond the shadow of the big house when Kizzy poked him in the ribs, tapped her finger above an ear, and whispered, What you call my head? Kungo, Kunta whispered back. She tweaked her hair. He said, Kuntinio. She pinched her nose. He told her, Nungo. She squeezed her ear. He said, Tulo. Giggling, Kizzy jerked up her foot and tapped her large toe. Sincumba, exclaimed Kunta. Seizing her exploring forefinger, wiggling it, he said, Bulokonding. Touching her mouth, he said, Da. Then Kizzy seized Kunta's forefinger and pointed it at him. Fa, she exclaimed. He felt overwhelmed with his love for her. Pointing to a sluggish small river they were passing a little later, Kunta said, Dat a Bolongo. He told her that in his homeland he had lived near a river called the Cambi Bolongo. That evening, when on the way back home, passing by it again, Kizzy pointed and shouted, Cambi Bolongo! Of course, she didn't understand when he tried to explain that this was the Mataponi River, not the Gambia River but he was so delighted that she had remembered the name at all that it didn't seem to matter. The Cambi Bolongo, he said, was much bigger, swifter, and more powerful than this puny specimen. He wanted to tell her how the life-giving river was revered by his people as a symbol of fertility, but he couldn't find a way to say it, so he told her about the fish that teemed in it, including the powerful, succulent Kujalo, which sometimes leaped right into a canoe, 
and about the vast living carpet of birds that floated on it until some young boy like himself would jump growling from the bush on the banks so that he could watch them rise up and fill the sky like some feathery snowstorm. Yaisa had told him about when Allah sent the Gambia a plague of locusts so terrible that they darkened the sun and devoured everything green until the wind shifted and carried them out to sea, where they finally fell and were eaten by the fish. Do I got a grandma? asked Kizzy. You got two, my mammy and yo mammy's mammy. How come they ain't with us? They don't know where we is, said Kunta. Does you know where we is? he asked her a moment later. We's in the buggy, Kizzy said. I means where does we live? At Massa Waller's. And where dad is? Dad way, she said, pointing down the road. Disinterested in their subject, she said, tell me some more about them bugs and things where you come from. Well, they's big red ants knows how to cross rivers on leaves that fights wars and marches like an army and builds hills they live in that's taller than a man. They sound scary. You step on them? Not less than you has to. Every critter got a right to be here same as you. Even the grass is live and got a soul just like people's does. Won't walk on the grass no more then. I stay in the buggy. Kunta smiled. Wasn't no buggies where I come from. Walked wherever we was going. One time I walked four days with my pappy all the way from Jafur to my uncle's new village. What Jufare? Done told you. Don't know how many times. That where I come from. I thought you was from Africa. That Gambia you talks about in Africa. Gambia a country in Africa. Jafur a village in Gambia. Well, where they at, Pappy? Cross the big water. How big that big water? So big it take near about four moons to get crossed it. Four what? Moons, like you say months. How come you don't say months? Cause moons my word for it. What you call a year? A rain. Kizzy mused briefly. How you get crossed that big water? In a big boat. Bigger than that rowboat we seen them foam men's fishing in? Big enough to hold a hundred men's. How come it don't sink? I used to wish it would have. How come? Cause we all so sick seem like we going die anyhow. How you get sick? Got sick from laying in our own mess practically on top each other. Why not you go to the toilet? The two bob had us chained up. Who two bob? White folks. How come you chained up? You done something wrong? Was just out in the woods near where I live, Jafur, looking for a piece of wood to make a drum with, and they grab me and take me off. How old you was? Seventeen. They ask your mammy and pappy if and you could go? Quinta looked incredulously at her. Would have took them too if and they could. To this day my family don't know where I is. You got brothers and sisters? Had three brothers, maybe mo by now. Anyways, they's all growed up, probably got chillins like you. We go see them some day? We can't go nowhere. We's going somewheres now. Just Massa John's. We don't show up. They have the dogs out at us by sundown. Cause they be worried about us? Cause we belongs to them, just like these hosses pulling us. Like I belongs to you and Mammy? Yous are youngin, that different. Missy Ann say she want me fo' her own. You ain't no doll for her to play with. I plays with her too. She done told me she's my best friend. You can't be nobody's friend and slave both. How come, Pappy? Cause friends don't own one another. Don't Mammy and you belong to one another? Ain't y'all friends? Ain't the same. We belongs to each other cause we wants to. Cause we loves each other. Well, I loves Missy Ann, so I wants to belong to her. Couldn't never work out. What you mean? You couldn't be happy when y'all grow up. Would too. I bet you wouldn't be happy. You show right about that. Ah, oh, Pappy, I couldn't never leave you and Mammy. And child, spec we couldn't never let you go neither. 
Chapter 75 Late one afternoon, the driver for Massa Waller's parents at Enfield brought him their invitation to attend a dinner party in honor of an important Richmond businessman who had stopped for a night's lodging on his way to Fredericksburg. About a dozen buggies were already parked outside the Enfield big house when Quinta arrived with the Massa soon after dark. Though he had been there many times in the eight years since he and Belle were married, it had been only during the past few months that the fat black cook Hattie, who had been so smitten with Quinta, decided to begin speaking with him again, ever since he had brought Kizzy along with Missy Ann one day on a visit to her grandparents. Tonight, when he went to the kitchen door to say hello and for something to eat, she invited him in to visit while she, her helper, and four serving women completed their preparations for dinner. Quinta thought that he had never seen so much food bubbling in so many pots and pans. How's how that little puddin' pie young in a yorin? Hattie asked between sips and sniffs. She fine, said Quinta. Belle got her learnin' how to cook now. Surprised me other night what a apple betty she'd unmade. That little Dickens. Next thing you know, I be eating her cookies instead of her eating mine. She must have put away half a jar of my ginger snaps last time she here. With a last look at the mouth-watering three or four kinds of breads that were baking in the oven, Hattie turned to the oldest of the serving women in their starched yellow smocks and said, "We's ready. Go tell Missus." As the woman disappeared through the swinging door, she told the other three, I come after y'all with a ladle if in your slops one drop of soup on my best linen when you settin' down to bowls. Get to work now, Pearl, she said to her teenage helper. Get them turnip greens, the sweet con, squash, and okra in the good china tureens whilst I wrestles this here saddle of mutton onto the carvin' boat. A few minutes later, one of the serving women came back in, whispered intently to Hattie at some length, and then hurried back out again. Hattie turned to Kunta. You members few months back when one dem trading boats got raided somewheres on the big water by that France? Kunta nodded. Fiddler say he heard that President Adams so mad he sent the whole United States Navy to whoop him. Well, they show sure did. Luvina just now told me that man and dare from Richmond say they done took away 80 boats belonging to that France. She say the white folks in there act like they nigh about ready to start singing and dancing about teaching that France a lesson. As she spoke, Kunta had begun digging into the heaping plateful of food she had set before him, while he marveled at the very sight of the roast beef, baked ham, turkey, chicken, and duck she was now busily arranging on big platters waiting to be served. He had just swallowed a mouthful of buttered sweet potato when the four serving women came bustling back into the kitchen, all loaded down with empty bowls and spoons. The soup set, Hattie announced to Kunta. A moment later, the serving women were trooping out again with heaped trays, and Hattie mopped her face and said, Got about forty minutes before they ready for dessert. You was gone say something before? Just gone say eighty boats don't make me no difference, said Kunta. Long's white folks messin' with one another instead of us. Seem like they ain't happy lessen days messin' with somebody. Pend who they messin' with, way I sees it, said Hattie. Last year was a <laughs> led a revolt against that two saint and he might a won if in the president hadn't have sent his boats down there to help Toussaint. Heard Massa Waller say Toussaint ain't got sense enough to be no gentle, let alone run no country on his own, said Kunta. He say just watch. All them slaves that done got free in that Haiti goin' to end up whole lot worse off than they was under they old masses. Cause that's what white folks hopin'. But I specs they already better off working to plantations they selves. One of the serving women, who had returned to the kitchen and was listening to the conversation, spoke up. Dat what they's talking about in there right now. Free <laughs> say it's way too many. Thirteen thousand just here in Virginia. The judge say he all fo free and <laughs> that do something outstanding. 
like dem what fit in dat revolution longside day masses, or dem what tole white folks about any <coughs> uprising plan, or dat <coughs> dat come out up with dat herb medicine that even white folks claim cure near about everything. The judge say he feel masses got the right in the wills to free all faithful. But him and everybody in there say days dead set against them Quakers and some other white folks set in day. Free for nothing. The serving woman headed for the door, adding, Judge say mark his words some new law is going to be made to put a crimp in that right soon. Hattie asked Kunta, what you think of that massa Alexandra Hamilton up north saying all free <coughs> ought to be sent to Africa cause <coughs> and white folks too different and ain't going to never get long. He right, that's what I thinks, said Kunta. But white folks talks dad and keeps bringing mo from Africa. You know why wells I do, said Hattie, puts him down in Georgia and the Carolinas to keep up with the cotton crop ever since that cotton gin come in a few years back. Same reason plenty masses round here selling day <coughs> off down south for as much as two, three times what they paid for them. Fiddler say the big masses down south got mean po cracker over Sears driving <coughs> like mules clearing land for new cotton fields, said Kunta. Yeah, it's how come the paper's lately so full of notices about runaways, said Hattie. Just then the serving women began returning to the kitchen with dirty plates and platters. Hattie beamed proudly. Look like they's done it all they can hold. About now, Massa pour into champagne whilst the table get cleared for dessert, she told Quinta. See how you like these plum pudding tarts. She set one on a saucer in front of him. Sides that day's getting brandied peaches in there, but I recollects you don't touch no liquor. Enjoying the succulent tart, Punta found himself recalling a runaway slave advertisement that Bell had read to him recently from the Gazette. Tall <coughs> wench, it said, very large breasts of which the right one has a deep scar, a sly liar and thief who may be showing a large forged pass since previous owner let her learn to write some, or who may be claiming herself a free <coughs> Hattie sat down heavily, fingered a brandied peach from a jar and popped it into her mouth, glancing across the kitchen at two high tubs filled with glasses, dishes, cutlery, and utensils yet to be washed and put away. She let out a loud sigh and said wearily, No one thing, she'll be glad to see my bed this night. Cause laud, I just plumb woe out. Chapter 76 For many years now, Kunta had gotten up every morning before dawn, earlier than anyone else on Slave Row, so early that some of the others were convinced that that African could see in the dark like a cat. Whatever they wanted to think was fine with him as long as he was left alone to slip away to the barn where he would face the first faint streaking of the day prostrated between two large bundles of hay, offering up his daily subuh prayer to Allah. Afterward, by the time he had pitched some hay into the horse's feed trough, he knew that Belle and Kizzy would be washed, dressed, and ready to get things underway in the big house, and the boss field hand, Kato, would be up and out with Ada's son, Noah who would soon be ringing the bell to wake the other slaves. Almost every morning, Noah would nod and say morning with such solemn reserve that he reminded Kunta of the Jeloff people in Africa, of whom it was said that if one greeted you in the morning, he had uttered his last good word for the day. But although they had said little to each other, he liked Noah, perhaps because he reminded Kunta of himself at about the same age. The serious manner the way he went about his work and minded his own business, the way he spoke a little but watched everything. He had often noticed Noah doing a thing that he also did, standing somewhere with his eyes quietly following the rompings of Kizzy and Missy Ann around the plantation. Once when Kunta had been watching from the barn door as they rolled a hoop across the backyard, giggling and screaming, 
He had been about to go back inside when he saw Noah standing over by Cato's cabin, also watching. Their eyes met, and they looked at each other for a long moment before both turned away. Quinta wondered what had Noah been thinking, and had the feeling that, likewise, Noah was wondering what he was thinking. Quinta knew somehow that they were both thinking the same things. At ten, Noah was two years older than Kizzy, but that difference wasn't great enough to explain why the two hadn't even become friends, let alone playmates, since they were the only slave children on the plantation. Quinta had noticed that whenever they passed near each other, each of them always acted as if they had not even seen the other, and he couldn't figure out why. Unless it was because at their age, they had begun to sense the custom that house slaves and field slaves didn't mix with one another. Whatever the reason, Noah spent his days out with others in the field while Kizzy swept, dusted, polished the brass, and tidied up the masses' bedroom every day. For Belle to inspect later with a hickory switch in her hand. On Saturdays, when Missy Ann usually came to call, Kizzy would somehow miraculously manage to finish her chores in half the time it took her every other day, and the two of them would spend the rest of the day playing, excepting at midday if the massa happened to be home for lunch. Then he and Missy Ann would eat in the dining room with Kizzy standing behind them gently fanning a leafy branch to keep away flies as Belle shuttled in and out serving the food and keeping a sharp eye on both girls, having warned them beforehand. Y'all let me catch you even thinking about giggling in there with Massa. I'll tan both yo hides. Quinta by now is pretty much resigned to sharing his kizzy with Massa Waller, Belle, and Missy Ann. He tried not to think about what they must have her doing up there in the big house, and he spent as much time as possible in the barn when Missy Ann was around. But it was all he could do to wait until each Sunday afternoon, when church would be over and Missy Ann would go back home with her parents. Later on these afternoons, usually Massa Waller would be either resting or passing the time with company in the parlor. Belle would be off with Aunt Suki and Sister Mandy at their weekly Jesus meetings, and Kunta would be free to spend another couple of treasured hours alone with his daughter. When the weather was good, they'd go walking, usually along the vine-covered fence row where he had gone almost nine years before to think of the name Kizzy for his new girl child. Out beyond, where anyone would be likely to see them, Quinta would clasp Kizzy's soft little hand in his own, as, feeling no need to speak, they would stroll down to a little stream, and sitting closer together beneath a shade tree, they would eat whatever Kizzy had brought along from the kitchen, usually cold buttered biscuits filled with his favorite blackberry preserves. Then they would begin talking. Mostly he'd talk and she'd interrupt him constantly with questions, most of which would begin, how come? But one day, Quinta didn't get to open his mouth before she piped up eagerly. You want to hear what Missy Ann learned me yesterday? He didn't care to hear of anything having to do with that giggling white creature, but not wishing to hurt his kizzy's feelings, he said, I'm listening. Peter, Peter, pumpkin eater, she recited, had a wife and couldn't keep her, Put her in a pumpkin shell. There he kept her very well. That it? he asked. She nodded. You like it? He thought it was just what he would have expected from Missy Ann. Completely asinine. You says it real good, he hedged. But you can't say it as good as me, she said with a twinkle. Ain't trying to. Come on, Pappy, say it for me just once. Get away from me with that mess. He sounded more exasperated than he really was but she kept insisting and finally, feeling a bit foolish that his kizzy was able to twine him around her finger so easily, he made a stumbling effort to repeat the ridiculous lines, just to make her leave him alone, he told himself. Before she could urge him to try the rhyme again, the thought flashed to Kunta reciting something else for her, perhaps a few verses from the Quran, so that she might know how beautiful they could sound. Then he realized such verses would make no more sense to her than Peter Peter had to him, so he decided to tell her a story. She had already heard about the crocodile and the little boy, so he tried the one about the lazy turtle who talked the stupid leopard into giving him a ride by pleading that he was too sick to walk. "'Where you hears all them stories you tells?' Kizzy asked when he was through. 
Heard him when I was yo age from a wise old grandmammy named Neo Boto. Suddenly, Kunta laughed with delight, remembering she was bald headed as an egg, didn't have no teeth neither, but that sharp tongue of her and show made up for it. Loved us youngins like her own, though. She ain't had none of her own, had two when she was real young, long time fo she come to Jafure. But they got took away in a fight tween her village and another tribe. Reckon she never got over it. Quinta fell silent, stunned with a thought that had never occurred to him before. The same thing had happened to Belle when she was young. He wished he could tell Kizzy about her two half-sisters, but he knew it would only upset her, not to mention Belle, who hadn't spoken of it since she told him of her lost daughters on the night of Kizzy's birth. But hadn't he, hadn't all of those who had been chained beside him on the slave ship been torn away from their own mothers? Hadn't all the countless other thousands who had come before and since? They brung us here naked, he heard himself blurting. Kizzy jerked up her head, staring, but he couldn't stop. Even took our names away. Them like you gets born here, don't even know who they is. But you just much kinty as I is, don't ever forget that. Usin's foe fathers was traitors, travelers, holy men. All the way back, hundreds o' reigns into that land call Old Molly. You understand what I'm talking about, child? Yes, Pappy, she said obediently, but he knew she didn't. He had an idea. Picking up a stick, smoothing a place in the dirt between them, he scratched some characters in Arabic. Dat my name, Kunta Kinti, he said tracing the character slowly with his finger. She stared, fascinated. Pappy, now do my name. He did. She laughed. Dat say Kizzy? He nodded. Would you learn me to write like you does? Kizzy asked. Wouldn't be fitten, said Kunta sternly. Why not? She sounded hurt. In Africa, only boys learns how to read and write. Girls ain't got no use for it. Over here, neither. How come Mammy can read and write then? Sternly, he said, Don't you be talking dat, you hear me? Ain't nobody's business. White folks don't like none of us doing no reading or writing. How come? Cause they figures less we knows, less trouble we makes. It wouldn't make no trouble, she said, pouting. If and we don't hurry up and get back to the cabin, yo Mammy go and make trouble for us both. Kunta got up and started walking, then stopped and turned, realizing that Kizzy was not behind him. She was still by the bank of the stream, gazing at a pebble she had seen. Come on now, it's time to go. She looked up at him, and he walked over and reached out his hand. Tell you what, he said. You pick up that pebble and bring it long and hide it somewhere safe. And if in you keeps your mouth shut about it, next new moon morning, I let you drop it in my gourd. Oh, Pappy, she was beaming. Chapter 77 It was almost time for Kizzy to drop another pebble into Kunta's gourd, about a year later in the summer of 1800 when the Massa told Bell he was going to Fredericksburg for about a week on business, and it was arranged that his brother would be coming over to look after things while he was away. When Kunta heard the news, he was even more upset than the rest of Slave Row, for he hated leaving Belle and Kizzy exposed to his former owner even more than he disliked having to be away from them for so long. Of course, he said nothing about these concerns, but on the morning of departure, as he left the cabin to hitch up the horses, he was taken aback that it seemed almost as if Belle had read his mind. She said, Massa John show ain't like his brother, but I knows how to deal with his kind. And it ain't but a week, so don't you worry none, we be fine. I ain't worrying, said Kunta, hoping she couldn't tell he was lying. Kneeling to kiss Kizzy, he whispered in her ear, Don't forget that new moon pebble now, and she winked conspiratorially as Belle pretended not to have heard, although she had known what they were doing for almost nine months now. For the next two days of the mass's absence, everything went on pretty much as usual, although Belle was mildly annoyed at nearly everything Massa John said or did. 
She particularly disliked how he sat up late in the study at night, drinking his brother's best whiskey from the bottle, smoking his own big, black, smelly cigars, and flicking the ashes on the carpet. Still, Massa John didn't interfere too much with Belle's normal routine, and he stayed mostly to himself. But the mid-morning of the third day, Belle was out sweeping off the front porch when a white man on a lathered horse came galloping up and leaped off, demanding to see the Massa. Ten minutes later, the man left as hurriedly as he had come. Massa John barked down the hallway for Belle to come into the study. He looked deeply shaken and it flashed in Belle's mind that something terrible had happened to Kunta and the Massa. She was sure of it when he brusquely ordered her to assemble all the slaves in the backyard. They all gathered, standing in a line, tense with fear as he flung open the back screen door and stalked out toward them. He had a revolver conspicuous in his belt. Coldly scanning their faces, he said, I just got word of some Richmond <laughs> plot to kidnap the governor massacre the Richmond white people and burn the city. The slaves gawked at one another in astonishment as he went on. Thanks to God, and a few smart <laughs> who found out and told their masses just in time, the plot's been crushed, and most of the <laughs> that started it already caught. Armed patrols are on the roads looking for the rest, and I'm going to make sure none of them decides to stop off here for the night. Because any of you got uprising notions, I'm going to be patrolling day and night. None of you are to set foot off this property. I don't want no gathering of any kind, and nobody outside their own cabin after dark. Patting his revolver, he said, I'm not as patient and soft with <laughs> as my brother. Any of you even looks like you're thinking about stepping out of line. His doctrine won't patch up a bullet between your eyes. Now get. Massa John was as good as his word. For the next two days, he enraged Belle by insisting upon watching Kizzy taste his food before he'd eat it. He roamed the fields on horseback during the day and sat on the porch at night with a shotgun across his lap, his vigilance so absolute that the slave row people dared not try even discussing the uprising, let alone plan one of their own. After receiving and reading the next issue of the Gazette, Massa John burned it in the fireplace, and when a neighboring Massa visited one afternoon, he ordered Belle to leave the house, and they huddled talking in the study with the windows shut, so it was impossible for anyone even to find out more about the plot, or especially about its aftermath, which was what had Belle and the others worried sick, not about Kunta, since he'd be safe with the Massa, but about the Fiddler, who had left on the day before they had to play at a big society ball in Richmond. The slave row people could only imagine what might be happening to black strangers in Richmond at the hands of enraged, panic-stricken whites. The fiddler still hadn't returned when Kunta and the Massa did, three days early, their trip cut short by the uprising. Upon Massa John's departure later that day, the restrictions he'd imposed were relaxed somewhat, although not completely and the Massa was very cold toward everyone. It wasn't until Kunta and Belle were alone in their cabin that he could tell her of what he'd overheard in Fredericksburg, that the black revolters already captured had been tortured into helping the authorities round up others involved, and some had confessed that the revolt had been planned by a free blacksmith named Gabriel Prosser, who had recruited around 200 hand-picked black men, butlers, gardeners, janitors, waiters, iron workers, rope makers, coal miners, boatmen, even preachers, and trained them for more than a year. Prosser was still at large, and the militia was combing the countryside for suspects, said Kunta. Poor white patrollers were terrorizing the roads, and there were rumors about some masses beating slaves, some to death, for little or no provocation. Look like our only hope is we's all they got, said Belle. If and they kills us off, they won't have no slaves no more. Fiddler back? asked Kunta, ashamed that he'd been so engrossed in telling what had happened that he hadn't thought of his friend until now. Belle shook her head. We all been mighty worried, but that Fiddler a crafty... <laughs> he get home all right. Kunta didn't fully agree. He ain't home yet. When the fiddler didn't return the next day, the Massa wrote a message notifying the sheriff and told Kunta to deliver it to the county seat. Kunta had done so, seeing the sheriff read the message and silently shake his head. Then returning homeward, 
Kunta had driven slowly for three or four miles, staring gloomily at the road ahead, wondering if he'd ever see the fiddler again, feeling badly that he had never actually expressed that he considered him a good friend, despite his drinking, his cussing, and other shortcomings, when he heard a poor imitation of a white cracker drawl, Hey! Kunta thought he must be hearing things. Where the hell you think you going? The voice came again. And reining the horses, Kunta looked around and along both sides of the road, but saw nobody. Then, suddenly, You ain't got no travel pass, boy. You in a heap of trouble. And there, climbing from a ditch, ragged and torn, cut and bruised, covered with mud while carrying his battered case and grinning from ear to ear, was the fiddler. Quinta let out a shout, jumping from his seat, and within seconds he and the fiddler were hugging and whirling each other around, laughing. You'd a spitting image of an African, I knows, exclaimed the fiddler, but couldn't be him. He wouldn't never let nobody know he glad to see him. Don't know why I is, said Quinta, embarrassed at himself. Fine welcome for a friend what crawled on his hands and knees all the way back from Richmond just to see a ugly face again. Quinta's seriousness conveyed the degree of his concern. Was it bad, Fiddler? Bad ain't even close to it. Thought show I'd be playing a duet with angels fo I got out in there. As Quinta took the muddy fiddle case and they both clambered into the wagon, the Fiddler continued talking non-stop. Richmond white folks just about crazy scared. Militiamen's everywhere stopping. And dem without a travel pass, next stop in jail with a headache. And dem to lucky ones. Packs of pole crackers roaming the streets like wild dogs, jumping on. Beating some so bad, can't hardly tell who they was. The ball I's playing at breakup halfway through when they gets first word bout the uprising. Missy's screaming and running round in circles. Masses pulling guns on us. Up on the bad stand, midst all the ruckus, I slips into the kitchen and hid in a garbage can till everybody gone. Then I climbs out a window and took to the back streets, staying away from lights. I'd got to the edge of town when all of a sudden I hears this shouting behind me, then a whole lot of feet's running same way I is. Something tell me they ain't black, but I ain't waiting to find out. I cuts round the next corner flying low, but I hears them gaining on me. And I's about to say my prayers when I see a real low porch that I rolls right under. It's real tight under there, and I's inching further back, just when them crackers goes running by with torches shouting, Get dat! I bumps against something big and soft and a hand clap over my mouth, and a voice say, Next time, knock! Turns out it's a warehouse night watchman seen a mob tear a friend of his apart, and he ain't got no tension o' coming out under that porch till next spring, if and it take that long to blow over. Well, after a while, I wishes him luck, and heads out again and makes it to the woods. That was five days ago. Would have made it here in fall, but so many patrollers on the roads. I had to keep to the woods, eating berries, sleeping in the thickets with the rabbits. Did all right till yesterday, a few miles east of here. Bunch of real mean crackers cotched me in the open. They's just spoiling the whoop they selves a... Maybe even string em up. They had a rope right there with em. They's shoving me back and forth, axin' who's... I is and where I thinks I's going, but not paying no attention to what I tells em. Till I says I's a fiddler. They haul on, they think size lime, and hollers, well, let's hear you play then. African, let me tell you something. I opened up that fiddle case, and you ain't never heard no concert like I give right out there in the middle of the road. Played turkey in the straw. You know Poe Crackers loves that. And fo I'm warmed up good, I had em all a hootin' and clappin' and tappin' de feets. And I ain't quit till they's had they fill and tell me to go ahead and don't dilly-dally getting my tail home. And I ain't neither. Done hit the ditch whenever I see a hoss or buggy or wagon coming until this one was you, and here I is. As they soon rolled into the narrow road leading to the big house, soon they heard shouting, and then saw the people of Slave Row running to meet the wagon. 
might think a body was missed round here. Although the fiddler was grinning, Quinta could sense how moved the man was, as grinning himself, he said, Look like you gon' have to tell the whole story all over again. You ever knowed that to stop me? asked the fiddler. Least ways eyes here to tell it. 